Hello and welcome to the first in our series of Racing Rules webinars. Uh, my name is Neil McLeod. I'm the RYE's Racing Services Manager and I'll be your host for the next six weeks where I'll be joined by a different rules expert each week as we delve deeper into the rulebook. We have six sessions planned, all focusing on the rules of part two, when boats meet. These sessions will be put out every Wednesday at 8 p.m and are aimed at club racing sailors, assuming little rules knowledge. Our aims are to introduce the rules that will be relevant to you and that you will be most likely to interact with on your way around the course. We hope to help you get more enjoyment out of the sport by increasing your confidence and familiarity with the rules. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comments box and we'll do our best to try and answer them now or in next week's session. In this session, we are joined by Chris Lindsay, who will be looking at how we find our way around the rule book and how we decide which boat has right of way. Chris is an international judge and umpire who has been appointed by World Sailing to the Tokyo Olympics, where he will be one of the first to take on the role of video officiating international technical official. He is currently one of the youngest IUs and IJs in the world and is also a member of the RYA's Racing Rules Committee and Judges and Umpires Committee where he takes the lead on umpire education. I'd now like to hand over to Chris to take us through the session. Hello everyone and um, thank you for joining us. Um, so my name is Chris Lindsay um, and I'm going to be taking you through the first of our sessions um, today um, called an introduction to the racing rules. So this is gonna be a very introductory session. We're gonna start by thinking about how we find our way around the rule book. Um, I'm gonna talk about the various parts of it, and then we'll get into how we decide which boat has right of way. So the main right of way rules that would apply um, on the water most often. So this will be quite a basic um, presentation. So um, if you're an experienced judge or umpire, um, you might find this level a bit low, um, but likewise, if you're somebody that um, generally recoils in horror whenever somebody mentions the rules, then this will really be for you. So I hope um, we'll, we'll really start um, at a level that everybody um, can, can get a handle on, on the rules we're talking about. And then as we go through um, the sessions with the other presenters the next five weeks, we'll build on that knowledge and give you a really um, strong foundation in, in the racing rules of sailing. So with that, we can start thinking about the rules. So here's a picture of the rule book that hopefully hopefully you've seen. If you don't have a copy of it, hopefully you've, you've already seen it. Um, you could be forgiven for thinking, if you look at the contents page here, that we have quite a complicated sport. There are actually more rules in sailing than in cricket, rugby, and football combined. There are a lot of rules, um, and often this can make um, the rules a little bit intimidating um, for people um, having to deal with quite so much. But in reality, it's not as complicated as it looks. Most of these rules are not going to apply to you in your everyday racing. So you can see we have um, parts one through seven, and then we have a lot of appendices. All of these are only going to apply really if you're getting into more specialist disciplines of sailing. So and um, things like match racing and team racing. The vast majority of the rules will not be generally of interest to you every day. And the number that you'll actually have to be aware of and have an understanding of to race is actually very few. And those are really the rules we're going to be focusing on for the next six weeks. So that's going to be what are called the rules of part two. So when boats meet. And um, so these are the, the kind of defensive rules that you use on the water to avoid collisions. We're really only going to be thinking about those and some definitions. So some of the words in the rules have a very particular definition that helps us understand what they mean. Um, and so we're going to use, uh, we're going to refer to those occasionally as well. The rest of it, we're not going to touch on. Um, not that those are not important, um, but we'll probably come back to those if we have another series um, or at some point later. For now, we're just thinking about the rules um, when boats meet. So if you don't have a copy of the rule book, um, you can get one quite easily. So it is free um, and you can download it at this link. Um, the, the slides will be available as well, so you don't have to worry about writing, writing this down or anything. When you click on this link, you'll find yourself taken to the World Sailing um, page here where you can download a copy um, of the rules. So you just would click here, you'll be able to download a PDF of them. You can see 
that the rules have a date um, that has a four year um, period. So they do change every four years um, and the next change is expected in January. Obviously with the postponement of the Olympics, um, there is a question over that. For now, we're just going to assume until we hear any different from World Sailing that in January, the new set will come out. But having said that, there are no major changes expected in January. So there will be a few tidy up things, but really the game is not gonna change very much um, for you. And for all the rules that we're talking about over the next six weeks, very little um, is gonna change really. If you are a smartphone user, you can also get an app um, that's a joint effort between the RYA and World Sailing. Um, and you can have this on your smartphone. Um, it's also free. You can download a PDF um, of the rules again um, and just keep that on your phone. It's very handy um, so you don't have to carry the rule book around um, with you all the time. So I would really recommend that as well um, if you don't already have it. One last bit of, of housekeeping, um, of some admin to introduce, um, are these things called world sailing cases, which you might have heard about. Um, and if you haven't, don't worry. Basically, world sailing cases are, well, the case book is a collection of incidents um, that have already occurred somewhere and then world sailing have explained how the rules would apply to each situation so we've got one here this is number 10 three boats going upwind and the case tells you how the rules apply um, to that situation this can be really useful um, as a reference guide just to have so i would recommend downloading it just keeping it somewhere if you're in a protest or you're in an incident on the water that leads to a protest or you just want to know how the rules apply to a situation, I would really recommend you just have a, a quick look through it um, and see if the situation you have um, is already in there. Um, because any protest committee is obligated to follow these interpretations. So you can have this in your back pocket um, to show them um, and it can be re a really useful thing um, to have. I don't recommend you read the whole thing cover to cover unless you're struggling to sleep but I definitely um, recommend that you do have it um, downloaded. Again, if you have the app, um, it's also available there. So very handy. Now, we're gonna get into um, the main rules that we're gonna be talking about. So this is my summary slide um, of the rules of part two. So the rules that govern when boats meet. Um, you can see I've split it up into a couple of different sections. Hopefully the first thing you notice is there's not actually that many of them. Um, so this is not as complicated as it might have first looked. I've split them up into different groups. So we've got here the main right-of-way rules, as they're called. So there's only four of them. There are some rules that limit what the right-of-way boat can do. Um, again, there's only three. Then there are some rules that apply when we reach the marks. Um, and then there are some rules that apply when we reach obstructions. So obstructions are things like a shoreline um, or stuff you can't actually sail through. Um, so that's what an obstruction is. And that's really it. There's a couple of extra um, pieces, bits and pieces here. Uh, we've got rule 14 that gives all boats an obligation to avoid contact. We'll get into that in later sessions. And then there's a couple of bells and whistles at the end. Um, things like OCS, so if you're over the line at the start, you've capsized or you're interfering, a boat's not racing. So all of these refer to very specific situations. So we'll get into those um, in later sessions as well. Um, but as I say, for tonight, all we're gonna be talking about are the main right-of-way rules, of which there are only four, so how easy. Um, these rules will tell you which boat in any situation has to keep clear. So the main right-of-way rules always apply. If I were to take two model boats, throw them up in the air, no matter what way they land on the table, one of these rules will always apply to them. So, um, and then we'll, we'll think about it and go through and explain how we decide which one um, that is. So if we look at the page of the rule book um, in which these rules are taken from, again, this can look a bit complicated, but I promise you it's not. Um, something to bear in mind as well is that often the rules are written, uh, well, they are written so that they can be easily translated into other languages and so that they cover every possible situation. And that often sometimes means that the wording is not as simple as it could be. So don't be put off by that. Um, it's really not as complicated. So this is the section that refers to right-of-way rules. It's only one page. 
Um, and like most um, things in the rulebook, it starts with a bit of text before we get into the rules. So these are the main right-of-way rules here, 10, 11, 12, and 13. There's this section before, which we call the preamble. All this does is tell you when these rules apply. So to break down the first part, this will not shock anybody. The racing rules of sailing apply to you when you're in the racing area um, or near it, and you are planning on racing, yeah, you are racing or you have been racing. Um, and this second part is just telling you that even if you are not racing, um, you cannot be penalized except if you cause serious damage or if you interfere with a boat that is racing. So not that's quite straightforward and intuitive. And then the second part uh, will probably not ever really apply to most people. Um, but this is if you meet a what's called a vessel, so we use this instead of the word boat. Uh, if you meet a vessel, so that is typically another uh, boat that's not a competitor, so not somebody that's involved in the racing. If you meet them, then the racing rules don't apply. Um, it's instead the government right of way rules, something called the ERPCAS. But as I say, that will probably not apply to most people. That's only really going to be relevant if you're racing somewhere like the, the Solent, where there are loads of other boats um, about that are not taking part in, in racing. So that's it. If that didn't make any sense, don't worry. Um, I'm just, just saying it to, for the sake of completeness. Then there are only four right away rules that we're going to think about. You'll notice there are sometimes words that are in italics. What the italics mean is that this word has a definition. So if we go back, to the, the start of our um, rulebook, you'll be able to see what that word means. And so now we're going to think about these four right of way rules um, and go through each one of them um, and explain how they, how they apply. So I'm a scientist. I like flow diagrams. So here is a flow diagram for the right of way rules of sailing. There's only three questions we have to ask ourselves to decide which one of these is the one that applies. So the first question, when we start up here, the first question is, is anybody tacking? If the answer to that question is yes, then we have a rule that applies. If not, then we have a couple of other questions. So what I'm now gonna do for the rest of this presentation is talk you through how we answer each of these questions. Is anybody tacking? Are you on the same tack? And if you are, are you overlapped or are you not? If you, can, if you can answer all those questions, you'll be able to decide which of these four right-of-way rules is the one that applies. So let's answer our first question, is anybody tacking? Well, to answer that, we have to decide what it even means to be tacking. What is a tack? Um, so we can break that down very easily. Boats will always have a windward side and a leeward side. So the windward side is the side that is closer to the wind. And then the side, the other side will be the leeward side. So for example, blue here, the wind is hitting her port side. That means that she's on port tack. Um, conversely for yellow, the wind is hitting her starboard side. So she's on starboard tack. So it's the side of your boat that the wind is closest to. That is your windward side. That corresponds to the tack that you're on at any moment. This is the same upwind and downwind with two small complications that you just have to keep in the back of your mind. If you are sailing by the lee or directly downwind, so sailing by the lee would mean that your mainsail is on the same side of your boat as the wind is hitting, in the case, for example, red here, then your leeward side is the side on which your mainsail lies. Therefore, the other side is the windward side, which corresponds to your tack. So in the case of red here, the mainsail is on the starboard side. That is her leeward side. So the windward side is the port side, meaning she is on port. In the case of green, the mainsail is on the port side now. She's sailing directly downwind. And um, that makes the leeward side um, the same side as her as her mainsail lies, and um, which puts her on starboard tack. So hopefully that's not too complicated. That's the only two um, exceptions. Otherwise, it's always the side that the wind is hitting, your windward side. Now, 
the question we set out to answer was, is anybody tacking? So that um, you can um, think of as being something that's going to involve changing your tack. There's a slight subtlety here that I want to make sure everyone um, understands. So we're going to talk a bit about what the transitions are. Um, if you go from here as yellow, um, in the first position on the left, from being on starboard to being on port, what's actually happening in between? So first of all, you change your tack by going through head to wind. That makes sense because we said that it's the side of your boat that the wind is hitting. So you don't change tack until you go through head to wind. So while yellow is luffing here, so she luffs, gets closer to the wind, she gets up to head to wind. During that whole time, she's still on starboard tack. So this whole time, she's still on starboard. Then as soon as she gets past head to wind, she'll be on port. She will have changed her tack. That is also the moment that you start tacking. However, you do not finish tacking until you reach close hold. Um, so that's really what this bit is telling you. You start to tack when you go through head to wind, and that is the moment that your tack changes in this case from starboard to port, but you will not be complete, you will not be finished tacking until you reach close hold. So that's the difference between tacking, which is this whole time, and changing your tack, which is this moment at head to end. So hopefully that is clear. Small difference, and it's unfortunate we use the same word for both, um, but hopefully that um, has, been, has, made, has made some sense. Why am I even talking about this? Well, we have a rule which says if you are tacking, so after a boat passes head to wind, she shall keep clear of other boats until she's on a close hauled course. So here we have yellow has passed three head to wind, so she is tacking and she must keep clear of blue. So it's very straightforward. If you're tacking, you have to keep clear. And you might say, well, what if both boats are tacking? Well, the rule goes on to say if two boats are subject to this rule at the same time, the one on the other's port side or the one astern shall keep clear. We sometimes summarize this, this is a mouthful, we summarize this often to if you're on the right, you've got the rights. So in general, looking upwind like that, um, it's the boat that is on the right, if they're both tacking on the right, that will be the right of way. Probably the most important word to pull out of this rule is going to be keep clear. So what, what does it mean to keep clear? And we're going to, you're going to keep hearing those words over and over over the next six weeks. They're probably some of the most important words in the rules. So we're going to introduce what that means. If you look at your rule book, you'll notice that keep clear is in italics. That means it's got a definition. If we turn to the definition of keep clear, you'll find this. So there's two parts. I've grayed out the second part because we'll get to that a bit later. Um, but if we look at the first part, a boat keeps clear of a right-of-way boat if the right-of-way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. So if we look here at blue and yellow that are obviously on a collision course, they're getting closer together. There will come a point at which the right-of-way boat, in this case blue, needs to take avoiding action in order to avoid a collision. At the moment that happens, that is when yellow will have failed to have kept clear. So that is the test, whether the right-of-way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. So if that happens, the keep clear boat will not have kept clear. What does her course mean? In general, that is your compass bearing. So if you imagine a line coming straight out of the bow of blue, that is her course at any given moment. Um, and if that course changes, or if she's had to change her course to avoid contact, um, so she's taken avoiding action, that will mean the keep clear boat has not kept clear. So that's all there is to the definition of keep clear. Notice that the word contact does not feature um, in that part of the definition. There is no need for contact um, for a boat to fail to have kept clear. As I said earlier, all boats have an obligation to avoid contact. Um, and so really, even if you are the right of way boat, you are at risk of being penalized yourself if you force the issue and try to cause contact when it was avoidable. So in this case, no need to um, have contact 
um, to prove that yellow has failed to keep clear. So now we're going to see if you can put what I've just said um, into, into practice. So we're going to have a short poll. So I want you to look at blue and yellow here. Um, and the question is, so in the final position, in position four, which boat must keep clear? So think about what we said, um, about how we decide if boats are tacking or not, and how the rule applies. If you want to take 30 seconds now, think about what the answer is going to be, and then we'll explain um, how the rules apply. Okay, hopefully you agree the answer should be yellow. We just think about why that would be. So both boats pass through head to wind. You can see here yellow has passed through head to wind here between positions two and three. Likewise, blue has passed through head to wind. So both boats are tacking. Neither boat has reached close hauled yet. Um, so that should tell us that both boats are tacking. Both boats are subject to this tacking rule we talked about, rule number 13. Um, and so the question is, how does the rule apply if, if both boats are subject to it? Well, we said, if you're on the right, you've got the right. So the one on the other is port side must keep clear. So in this case, blue is gonna be right away. Blue is on the right. So yellow is the boat that must keep clear. Hopefully that made some sense. And then on we go. So we've already addressed the first question. Is anybody tacking? Yes or no? Um, so if you decide that nobody is tacking, um, and in all honesty, that is probably the more likely of all the scenarios. Rule 13 doesn't apply all that often. Then that leads us to the next question. Are you on the same tack? Well, we've already sort of talked about how we decide what tack a boot is on. So hopefully um, you're all okay with that. If the answer to that is no, you're not on the same tack, then we have very straightforward rule um, that we get um, led to in those cases. That is port starboard or rule number 10. So nice and straightforward. When boats are on opposite tacks, a port tack boat shall keep clear of a starboard tack boat. And again, you see that word keep clear, meaning if the right of way boat can sail her course with no need to take avoiding action. So it's exactly the same test. Um, and as I said, we're going to keep coming back to those words, keep clear. So if you're on opposite tacks, the port tack boat must keep clear. Notice as well that the words hold your course do not mean anything. Um, very often we see port tack boats that are going to cross shouting hold your course. In terms of the rules, that doesn't actually mean anything. Um, the starboard boat um, should, as I said, act to avoid contact whenever it becomes clear that the port boat will not be keeping clear and the collision is going to be um, imminent. Um, so shouting, a shouting of hold your course from the port tack boat places no obligation on the starboard boat. She still has to act to avoid contact um, if it looks like it's going to occur. It's really quite straightforward. Now, um, I think it goes without saying, probably port starboard protests are some of the most common um, that we see. And at this point, I'd like to point out um, one world sailing case. I kind of mentioned them earlier. This is probably the most important one, or at least the one that I would recommend you're most familiar with. Um, this is case number 50. It's the only, only one, the, the number of it I happen to know. Um, and you can think of this as how to win a port starboard protest, because this case really tells you what logic the protest committee are going to have to use um, if they're going to decide a, a port starboard protest. So if we have a look at the words that are in the case, so there's a bit more to it. If you follow the link, you'll be able to see the, the full wording, but I've kind of, I've summarized it here, hopefully. So when the protest committee finds in, in a port starboard incident that the starboard boat did not change course and that there was not a genuine and reasonable apprehension of a collision, it should dismiss her protest. That's the first sentence. So what that is saying is that 
for the starboard boat to, in inverted commas, win this protest and get the uh, get the port boat disqualified, she's going to have to show that she did change her course because she thought there was contact. So if you're the starboard boat, you're going to be saying, um, I, I did have to change my course and I did that because I thought there would be a collision if I didn't. So the words are, there needs to be a genuine and reasonable apprehension of a collision. And on the flip side of that, if S did change course and that there was reasonable doubt that port could have crossed, then P should be disqualified. So the port boat should be disqualified. So if you're the port tack boat, you're going to be arguing, well, I could have crossed. It doesn't matter that the starboard boat changed course. Even if um, they hadn't, I would still have been able to cross um, clearly. So this is a really useful thing to keep in the back of your mind. If you're ever in a port starboard protest, you can know what logic the protest committee will apply. This will help inform you what points you should really try and get across um, in, your, in that hearing, in the protest, what witnesses you might call because what things you might think are important. So just always keep that in the back of your mind. If you're the port attack boat, you have to show that you would have crossed anyway. If you're the starboard attack boat, you have to show that you changed course and you did so because you thought there was going to be contact. So this gives you some insight into how a protest committee would decide a port starboard case. Importantly, just before we move on, I will say that uh, the test that gets applied in protests, um, it's not the same as things like beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, there's no onus of proof or anything um, in sailing. So what we tend to say is that the protest committee applies the balance of probabilities. So they would hear all of the evidence and they would decide which of the two scenarios seems like the more likely to have occurred. So it's basically which, if one is 51% more probable, then that's the one that they'll go with. So it's just balance of probabilities. Neither party has to prove their case um, in that respect. It can be difficult if there are no witnesses, for example, and you have one party saying one thing and one party saying the other, it's just up to the protest committee to decide which they find um, the most convincing. So having addressed that, we can go back to our, our flow diagram now. We've already answered two of the questions. So now we've only got one question left which is if we decide nobody is tacking and the boats are then the same tack, the answer is yes. Then we're left with this final question, are you overlapped, yes or no? If the answer is yes, we have a rule for that. If the answer is no, we also have a rule for that. So it will either be a windward leeward or clear ahead, clear astern situation. So how do we decide, first of all, if boats are gonna be overlapped? So hopefully you'll see this is not, not rocket science. Again, it's a defined term. We just look at the definition. So overlap. One boat is clear astern of another when her hull and equipment in normal position are behind a line of beam from the aftmost point of the other boat's hull and equipment in normal position. It's a bit of a mouthful, but hopefully you can see it's not as complicated as it um, potentially looks. Here, we've got blue and yellow again. Um, in this situation, we to decide if they're overlapped, we just draw a dotted line from the aftermost point of yellow's hull and equipment in normal position. So we ask ourselves, what is the furthest back point of that boat's hull and equipment? And we draw a perpendicular line across it, like so. Then ask, is the other boat behind that line or are they in front of that line? So in this case, blue is behind that line. She's therefore clear astern. If, on the other hand, blue was in front of that line, she would be overlapped. In this case, she'd be overlapped, we'd say, to windward. So she would be the windward boat here. You might ask, why does the rule say normal position? Well, this is a very complicated way of saying something that seems simple. Why are the words normal position there? And the reason, really, is so that you can't um, game it by changing the position of your equipment in order to artificially create an overlap. So take this situation where we have blue and yellow now um, running with spinnakers. So they're sailing downwind with spinnakers. Here, um, in this first situation on the left, 
Yellow has let her spinnaker sheet out, so her spinnaker now is flying in front of the boat well, um, further, much further than it would have been normally. So that is not how Yellow would normally be sailing downwind with her spinnaker. She's deliberately tried to make her boat longer so as to create um, an overlap. We would then decide that spinnaker is not in its normal position, so it does not count for the purposes of an overlap. Um, and then if it doesn't count, then we would go back to the hull. So that would be the furthest, the, the, the furthest most point um, on that boat. Um, and again, that's not now behind the line. So they would not be overlapped, they'd be clear. If however, yellow sails normally, the spinnaker is where it would normally be, um, then it can count for the purposes of an overlap. Um, and so that the yellow and blue would now be overlapped. Um, in that case. The other time this happens is with, with uh, bowsprits. So if you sail um, and have your boat with a bowsprit and a jenniker, if you put the bowsprit out um, when it's clearly not in its normal position, for example, you're going upwind, so you would never need the bowsprit, that will not be in its normal position. And so again, that will not count um, for the purposes of an overlap. Um, so that that is, is why those words um, are in there. Um, and how you decide what part of the boat is the furthest back point, it is as simple as that. So if you have the tran transom hung rudder or some other part of the boat that sticks out the back, it will be that, that point. So it'll be the furthest bit back of your boat will be, or the, the boat that's in front um, that will be, in, that's in its normal position um, that will be the point at which that overlap um, starts. Good. There are two small complicating things to keep in your mind um, um, just beyond what I said about overlap. These will become clearer when we talk about marks um, in a couple of weeks um, or with the presenter that's doing marks. But I just present them now so that you've seen them before. You can also be overlapped if there is a boat in between you which overlaps you both. So that um, doesn't make a lot of sense in words, but if we look at this picture here, clearly based on what I've already said, yellow is overlapped with green because green is in front of that dotted line. Yellow is also overlapped with blue because again, she's in front of that dotted line. Now, because of that, this also means that green and blue are both overlapped because a boat in between them overlaps both. So in this situation, all three boats will be overlapped with each other. Again, why that is important is when, when we come to think about marks, a lot of the rules around marks will, will be determined by who is overlapped with whom. Um, so just keep this in the back of your mind. Then on the right, we have another situation. Um, you're also overlapped um, if both boats are sailing more than 90 degrees from the true wind. So here, um, the eagle eyed will notice that the boats are on opposite tacks. One boat's on port, one boat's on starboard. So if you're both sailing more than 90 degrees from the true wind, that doesn't actually matter. You can both still be overlapped. Again, becomes important when we talk about marks. If you think about sailing downwind, um, this would be important. So if that didn't make a, um, a whole lot of sense, don't worry about it. Um, it'll, make, it'll become clearer in later sessions, but um, Hopefully um, that's not too taxing. So I've got again now another poll. We'll see um, how well you've understood that. So again, look at the situation now. We've got a blue boat and a couple of yellow boats. And the question that you're being asked is which boats are not overlapped with blue? So again, take 30 seconds, think through your answer, um, and I'll explain it, um, what the answer should be. Okay, hopefully you can see the answer should have been A and C. So if we just think about why that would be the case. So let's work through each of these boats. I'm going to start with D and E first of all. 
So we've got our blue dotted line here at the aftmost point um, of blue of her equipment at normal position. So there we go, dotty, dotty, dotty. D is in front of that line. Um, and so she would be overlapped. So it's not going to be D. E, although she's not in front of the line, E is overlapped with D, who is overlapped with blue. And so E will also be overlapped. So it's not going to be E. If we look over here. C is not overlapped because she's not in front of that dotted line. There is not a boat in between C and blue. Um, so that rule, that part of the rule doesn't apply. So C is going to be clear astern. Um, so that is going to be one of the answers. B is in front of the dotted line. So she is going to be overlapped. And then finally, A, although A is sailing more than 90 degrees from the true wind, blue is not. So for the final exception that I talked about, both boats have to be sailing more than 90 degrees from the tree wind. So that was a bit of a gremlin there, um, but that, uh, th that part of the rule does not apply because both boats were not sailing more than 90 degrees from the tree wind. So A is not overlapped with blue. Good. Okay, so now we move on um, to the final question. Are you overlapped? So if, uh, if on the same tack. So if we've decided that, that the answer to that question is yes, um, then it's rule of number 11. So the windward boat has to keep clear. So the boat that is closest to the wind is the one that must keep clear. And if the answer is no, um, then it's the boat that is clear astern that has to keep clear. So hopefully that's quite straightforward. So overlapped, it's windward boat keeps clear, not overlapped, but clear astern has to keep clear. And now you might be asking, well, we, we said that keep clear was, was defined about whether the right-of-way boat could sail her course. Clearly, in both of these situations, the right-of-way boat can sail her course pretty easily. But actually, keep the definition of keep clear has a second part. So it says, when the boats are overlapped, if the right-of-way boat can also change course in both directions without immediately making contact. So it's this second part of the definition that we use when we're talking about boats that are going to be overlapped. So if we look at blue and yellow here in position one, yellow is going to be the windward boat. Again, the wind coming down from the top of the page. So yellow has to keep clear. And we ask ourselves for blue, can she change course in both directions? without immediately making contact? I think the answer here is yes. So that means yellow is keeping clear. Then we see the gap is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And eventually there will become a point, maybe around position five, where now if blue did change course in either direction, there would immediately be contact. That means yellow is now no longer keeping clear. So that's all there is um, to that. Again, there is no need for there actually to be contacts here. Um, this test is a theoretical one, um, so you don't actually have to show that there was contact. You just have to show that the distance was small enough that if you had changed course, there would have been. And obviously, this will depend on the type of boats. Um, it, you can get much closer in Optimists than you can in 35-foot cruisers, um, and it will also depend on the conditions um, and that sort of stuff. Um, but you can see the, the test that would generally be applied to decide if overlapped boats are keeping clear. So that's it. That is all there is to the right-of-way rules of sailing. How easy. Um, you're all my experts um, having followed through that far. So all we need to do um, is use this flow chart to decide, is anybody tacking? If yes, it's going to be rule 13 while tacking. If no, we need to decide if they're on the same tack. If they're not, it's going to be port starboard they are, are they overlapped? If not, then it's clear ahead, clear astern. The boat clear astern must keep clear. If they are overlapped, then it's going to be windward leeward. The boat to windward must keep clear. So that is it. That is all there is um, to it, the racing rules of sail, to the, the right of way rules um, in sailing. So to summarize kind of all the stuff I've been saying, I have a final poll. So same again. You're asked, this time it's a yellow boat that's in the middle. And the question is, which blue boat must keep clear of yellow? So again, 30 seconds, and try to answer as best you can, and then I'll, I'll explain the answer.
Okay, hopefully you find the answer was A. So let's think through how the rules would apply um, to these situations. So we've got yellow is sailing directly downwind. So we said how we figure out yellow's tack. She's sailing directly downwind. So her leeward side is the side on which her mainsail lies. That is on the starboard side, which means that she is on port tack. So immediately we can say the other boats, which are on starboard, in this case, B, C and D, they will not have to keep clear of yellow because they're right of way boats with respect to her. So yellow has to keep clear of them. So it's not gonna be B, C or D. Then we've got um, A, F and E, which are on the same tack as yellow. And then we have to decide, are you overlapped or not? So we draw the dotted line again, um, out from the back of yellow. F is in front of that, so overlapped. E is also in front of it, so overlapped. But in both of those cases, the windward boat would be yellow. So yellow would have to keep clear again. So it's not going to be F or E. However, A is on the same tack as yellow and she is clear astern. Therefore, A must keep clear of yellow. So that is the only blue boat that has to keep clear of yellow. The reason I put this situation in is actually quite important to realize if you are um, sailing downwind on port tack, you actually have very few rights to haul. There's only one blue boat here that would have to keep clear of you. So something to bear in mind. Then finally, something I've added in at the end, um, just to remind you all, if you do break one of these right of way rules while you're sailing, what are your obligations? How do you exonerate yourself or how do you take a penalty? A penalty, if you break one of these rules, is two penalty turns, which involves two things. First, you must get well clear. So you have to basically get out of the way of other boats that you might interfere with. So you have to sail, sail off for a bit and get into some, some free space. Then you have to do two tacks and two jibes in the same direction. So it doesn't matter if you do the jibes first or the tacks, but you have to pass, uh, you have to do both of them in the same direction. And it has to be one continuous smooth movement um, like this. So this will be one penalty turn. So we've got passing hit through head to end, attack, and then we jibe, and then we finish up on the other side. So that is two tap. So you have to basically do that twice um, for that to be a penalty. And they do have to be in the same direction. This is not as um, some people used to refer to this as a 720. Um, you don't actually have to go through 720 degrees. As you can see here, we've done one turn, we haven't gone through 360. That is perfectly fine. You just have to do two tacks and two jibes. What if you only realize after racing though? Then your options are a bit more limited. So there it will depend on the rules at your particular event. Um, very often now, nowadays you have the opportunity to take a post-race penalty. So that can be like a 20 or 30% penalty that might be offered in the sailing instructions. Then you can do that if the sailing instructions allow for it. If they don't, then your only option really is going to be to retire. So if you realize you've broken a rule, um, the rules of sportsmanship would dictate that you, you admit fault and you take a, a penalty, so you retire. But do check your sailing instructions because very often um, a different provision is made for different events. Um, retiring is quite a big penalty and often organizers want to change it to something else and that's perfectly fine. So I always recommend that you look at your sailing instructions. Um, and obviously there are other options um, that some people use for taking penalties on the water. There's this yellow flag scoring penalty that's available, um, which tends to be bigger boats that use that sometimes. And then again, check your sailing instructions before you, um, before you go out racing. And again, if this should happen, say at the finish line, um, which can often happen with lots of boats and it's quite crowded, um, if you've already finished, so let's say you pass the finish line, um, you're in an incident at the finish line, so you've already crossed the finish line, you've already finished, but you broke a rule as you did so, then you would need to take the penalty and refinish. So you'd have to do your two turns, come back um, onto the core side of the line, and then cross it again. And it would be your second finishing time then that would count. Um, so that's what you would need to do if it happens at the finish line. 
So that is all I wanted to, to talk about. I'm going to leave you um, with one final word to say about if you are um, an RA member or from a club um, in the UK, the RA offers its rules advisory service. So if you do have any questions, um, particular ones that I haven't answered, um, and there are specific questions, you can send them into the advisory service. So this is an informal opinion that you will get, but it will come from some very experienced race officials um, who have really seen it all before and will be able to give you a reasoned um, opinion. Um, but as long as you understand that it's not um, in any way binding or anything, you will get a very quick response. Normally it will be within a couple of days. Um, and all you do is send in your uh, your question to that email address, racingrules at rwa.org.uk. Um, so I'd encourage you to make use of that service um, and hopefully you'll get some, some, good, um, some good answers from them. So that is everything. We are now finished session one. Thank you very much um, for, um, for joining us. I hope you find that useful. Um, I've certainly enjoyed presenting it. Um, so I'm going to say goodbye from me. I'm going to hand over back um, um, to Neil now. Thank you very much, everybody. Goodbye. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And thank you, everyone, for watching the first of our Racing Rules series. Uh, we hope that you find the session informative. And if you remember nothing else of the rules, then really try to remember these four rules that we've talked about in this session. So next week, I'll be joined by Matt Goodburn, who will be discussing the start and the limitations of the right-of-way bowl. So we hope to, to see you there. Thanks and goodbye.